Okay, so I want to, to tell you the story of why I am so interested in this. It's because uh, in 2011 and also in 2012, we tried to start a common node database effort. That means that um, we would have liked to have one node database and one map for all the communities to work on together and join forces. But this didn't work for various reasons, because mainly because different communities have different needs. And, but if I do, uh, if I fast forward to today, and I ask myself, do we have what we hope for? No. And Nicolas is not proud of us. So which are the reasons for this? Slow progress and fragmentation, duplication of efforts, because different groups are working on the same features, but in different languages or the same, even the same languages, but just duplicated. And um, we have very different software, which is not interoperable. But there's also one reason, one more reason. And this might be the elephant in the room. The reason, the thing we don't want to, we know it's there, but we kind of ignore it. And it might be because it's just too fucking complex. Uh, many of these projects, including our project, uh, are too complex for people to get uh, comfortable working with. And so people give up. Uh, experience has taught me that if developers are interested in a specific feature of your project, they will be discouraged by complexity. That means uh, that they will not be able to contribute without putting a huge and unlikely amount of effort. And I want to uh, underline unlikely because um, if other people are interested in one specific feature or two of your software, and your software is big, they, have, uh, mm, they don't have a lot of time, so they have to optimize. And after a few days, they will give up. This is something experience has taught me. So we develop uh, very cool open source projects, but we get very little contributions, and that's bad. So, NetJSON could be a step in the right direction, but it will take time. So we can start doing something now. Now is better than never. And what can we do? So I want to tell uh, what we started to do. Uh, extract key features in libraries, which are small, reusable, standalone, and well-documented. And I want to underline well documented because in this world of networking and mesh networking, documentation is really poor. So uh, they should focus on one problem and solve it well, or a few related problems, aka the Unix philo philosophy, and should encourage, encourage contributions by clearly explaining how to contribute. And now you might be wondering, what are the freaking benefits to do this? Because it's quite some work to do it. And well, simplicity is beautiful, and one problem is easier to get right. A small library is, easy, is easier to maintain, and it's easier to document, and it's easier to use and integrate in other projects. A simple library is more likely to receive contributions, and if it's standalone, can be used by a wider range of people. Uh, you might develop something, and you might not expect that somebody else in a completely different field start using it. But that's good for you, because you will receive feedback. And the, re the library will result in better and long-lived software. And it will also attract interest to your main project, which is really cool. Because um, if you have three or four features um, in small libraries, you will likely attract much more interest to your project if those libraries are successful to your main project, I mean. So let's cite, I want to cite a real world example in which we, I started to simplify all the things. This example is not shot. It's the map tool we use in Linux. And um, there's a new version that I've been developing from quite some time now. And, um, and also I think there were a few things wrong with it. It had too many features. It was hard to contribute. And the modules 
were not standalone, they were dependent from one another. So it doesn't, doesn't make any difference to have a monolithic or a modular with um, a self-dependency. Uh, people interested in one specific feature, they still have to use all the modules or many modules. So that might not work well. So we started extracting and simplifying. One of these uh, is NetDiff, uh, the library I told you about before. Um, if I manage to do it, I would like to show you really quickly how it works. Okay. Is that okay? I have some code here. Okay. I start Python interpreter. Okay. I import what I need. Uh, in this example, I use the OLSR parser and the diff function, which is the main uh, utility of the library. So uh, I have um, I have a Olasar JSON info on the hard drive, which is stored in that file. Fuck. Okay, I did something wrong. Sorry. Okay, so no, so now snapshot one is a parser that has parsed the JSON info plugin. It's just, it's just a JSON similar to what I showed you in the beginning, the network graph, but is different for every protocol. So uh, OLSR1 has uh, a custom JSON. Um, now I can convert this to net JSON just by I'll show you something that you can read easily, hopefully. I mistyped. Okay, so now I converted the OLSR JSON info plugin output to NetJSON. Um, but I can also do something more interesting for some people at least. Depends. What? Yeah. So now, sorry again, the same mistake as before. Okay, so in snapshot two, I have another JSON info that has one link more compared to the other snapshot. So now I can uh, calculate the difference of the two in, and store it in result. And you'll see the, the result in JSON format, which follows uh, the NetJSON standard. Well, standard. We are attempting to, at least. <laughs> so uh, there is only one link and one node added to the topology. If there was some, something else that would have changed, we would have the removed or changed section field with data. So why this is important? It is important because all the other node databases and tools which ha use a database to store the topology information, uh, they don't have to re-implement the uh, logic which understands what changes in the topology, and um, they can recycle this library, which already works with uh, three or four routing protocols. So they can save a lot of work, and if they find anything that doesn't work, 
or can be improved, they can contribute to something that other people used to instead of reinventing. So now I go ahead. So another example is um, this library called Python GeoJSON Elevation, which is a proxy to the Google Elevation API, which is the API Google offers to find out the elevation of a specific geographic point. And we use it to generate this uh, profile elevation on our map. So this is a leaflet plugin which expect GeoJSON. I implemented the elevation proxy inside NodeShot. Then I realized that this could be useful also to other people. So we extracted, extracted it and other people can use it too independently and can even replicate the same design if they want because this is also an open source plugin in JavaScript. So you, you put this on your web page, use the library on the server, and you get this result, more or less. On Google Elevation API, oh. And this is um, Esri map. You can use any, you know, it's just an API. What, what you use on the map. The API is Google. The data is not property of Google. It's some other company. Hmm? Oh yeah, sure, you can do that. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is, if you do something useful, don't, don't, don't get it stuck in a big project. Take it out and do something that other people can reuse and improve. And another good piece of software, uh, we started implementing GeoJSON in, in our RESTful API. So I found out another project that was just born. So I abandoned what I was doing and I joined force with them and we developed this one. This project here that now has uh, about um, 9,000 downloads each month and we get quite many patches and issues. And there is another library we use uh, to um, allow extending the um, model of the database of some objects so users can customize fields and add fields is Django HStore which is a Postgres uh, feature and this is also very widely used and Django 1.8 even included part of the code and you can read here uh, if you want to find out more and there are also a few other libraries. I won't get into details. And I'll also show you some data, because um, let's say, sorry, I cannot see. OK. So let's talk about data now. Because I, I told you some nice stories, but I also want to offer you some practical information. So um, I collected some uh, usage metrics uh, of NodeShot and all the features we extracted, which are summed up. And now I will compare them. So pull requests in the last six months. Uh, on NotShot we got 13, while in all the libraries summed up we got 44, which is three times more. Uh, the downloads on the Python package index, uh, NotShot has, in the last month, sorry, uh, NotShot has uh, 300, roughly, and all the libraries summed up together have 78 times more, while the GitHub clones The total, total number. So if somebody had downloaded all the libraries, it's probably uh, five. Five or six. Five. 
by the libraries. So, uh, GitHub clones, not shot as uh, 95 in the last month, while the libraries has 14 times more. And unique clones, libraries have 30 times more. And the page views, the libraries only have two times more, while the unique visitors have five times more the libraries. So, if we compare the usage metrics of all the libraries summed up together, we have an, an average increase, this is the average, of 22 times compared to NotShot. That means that um, the libraries, when extracted, are getting more users and more feedback and more contributions. And Abram approves. And now imagine if all those features were stuffed into NotShot. Do you think we will still get the same amount of overall usage metrics? I don't think so. Why usage metrics matter? It's a form of validation. It means the software is useful, and it means the software will be long-lived. And it also helps you to understand if you're doing something wrong or right, because if nobody uses what you do, and nobody gives a shit, maybe what you're doing is not so useful, and you should adjust your direction. So let's sum up what you should not be doing, in my opinion. Do not stuff too many features into a single huge pro project, because this makes it hard to integrate. It makes it hard to contribute. It results in less feedback, which in turn results in worse software. And do not mix l logic of core features, like you know the uh, software that understands what changes in the topology, or what generates configuration of a device, or what compiles image of a firmware. Don't mix that with the web framework code, because otherwise, let's say, if you're using Web2Py and I'm using Django, I won't be able to use what you have done. Extract your, your feature from the web framework so I can inc include it and contribute to it. And do not wait to achieve perfection before uh, releasing, because you won't. You cannot get it perfect at the first attempt. And what I suggest you to do, extract the features in small standalone reuse reusable libraries, contribute to existing projects when possible, write the docs, in English, please, provide a way to get in touch. Don't put projects there and leave no information. Release early, release often. And find ways for others to know about these libraries. So if you develop a plugin for a certain framework, go to the mailing list of that framework and uh, present what you've done. Try to include the link in the documentation, and so on. Listen to feedback from occasional contributors because diversity is healthy and different communities will build different solutions according to their needs. I'm not saying that now you have to give up uh, what you're doing and use another project because you spend time uh, on what you have done and you love it and you want to see it grow. But the low level implementations of the core features can be shared across projects. We are already doing that with Linux and OpenWRT. And so I think we should do more of it. Uh, interoperability plus collaboration plus diversity equals growth. If we, have, uh, if we don't have interoperability, uh, we have uh, not much collaboration and not, not diversity, I think we will have stagnation. So I hope we can thrive together and the presentation is finished. Thank you for listening. And if you have questions now, go ahead. Go ahead. Do we have a microphone? I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment. Uh, can you wait a second? Oh, OK. Sorry. Say not, I'm not sure if it's working. 
Thank you. But, uh, I'm trying to think of it like uh, what is uh, is this uh, directed? Uh, is this talk directed to developers or is it directed to community members? I think both, um, but more to developers, uh, because developers are ultimately, ultimately those ones who have the power to act and improve the direction we are going collectively. But community network members can persuade and can try to understand the underlying motives that are uh, behind this work and can try to convey this uh, to developers because maybe developers have not understood, have not paid attention. So everybody can um, do something, I think. Because, uh, I get the idea that uh, in, uh, in the term of uh, developing all this uh, software in uh, all the communities, we, we lose the actual point why we do it. You know, we create a new database to help the users like, uh, uh, be more productive, creative, create more complex networks. And remove you know the complexity of uh, of building a network, um, a very complex network with many nodes and many connections, and make it very easy for the users that like to, to to do something. And um, instead of putting so much effort into creating you know a killer application, we put a lot of effort into tools, libraries, APIs, uh, a lot of uh, conversations about uh, the CML, a lot of a lot of conversations of uh, integration. So I think. Uh, my opinion is that we should uh, refocus on this, on uh, what do we need those tools for, and why we started doing this. And um, I'm afraid to say that uh, many implementations are incomplete, but the needs, you know, like for uh, for each community, are very, very, very similar. The only large differences we have are the routing protocols. The routing protocols and the rapids can actually adapt to what we are going to build. If we're going to build something that is like really interesting for all the communities in the world, I think uh, the first idea would be good like to sit and really uh, draw out the architecture. What is all the possibilities? Let's think of uh, a simple network, and then adapt protocols to talk to that. That's my idea. Uh, building a lot of uh, a lot of tools is good. They're excellent. I mean, I like the way. This makes it very simple you know, to give all the JSON data and everything. But uh, I think we're focusing on that. We, we're moving away and we're focusing more on the development side rather than development, rather than focusing you know, on, the, on the actual needs of the communities. Yeah, um, that is true. And that's why uh, I insisted a lot of, on thinking about the benefits in the long run because. Uh, I, I'll tell you that now it's like three or four years that some developers are, have been focused on building the tool, but they have not been able to complete it because it's too much work to do just in one or two. And whatever you try to do, nothing is standardized and you will have to build everything yourself, which will cause you a lot of problems, a lot of bugs, which will be hard to fix. Uh, so there, there must be some kind of balance between building the stuff you need very quickly and trying to build something for the long run, I think. Still, I think that's the reason why uh, the interoperability project failed. Yeah. We focused in, like, in different uh, directions and different applications rather than focusing on what the communities uh, need like, uh, out of those two. OK, thank you. But I think this can really help even in developing the right applications. At the moment, we have, uh, even at the moment, we have a web application and we have some data source and some intermediate data. And we have, let's say, five different routing protocols. We have uh, five, 50 different ways to store the stuff. And, no comp and suddenly you say, OK, every of these 50 projects which have to implement interfaces for five different routing protocols. And maybe then your database might you have one database for your project and a visualization for your, your project and nobody will ever try to adapt this to a different database because they speak a different language. Having some common language to talk in a, between different layers of our software can make it much
much easier and much less complex to reuse code. In the moment, lots of projects are halfway done or 80% done, and we'll never get to 100% because the people who wrote it stop using it, and the rest of the people who might use the code say, yeah, it's okay, but it doesn't use the right database. It cannot understand my data source, so it's worthless for me. I have to restart or everything. And that's where this common languages like that tracing can really, really help. And there is a question from there, but I would like to add something that now came to my mind. Uh, it's also good to develop something that works for your community, do it, and then afterwards understand which features are worth extracting. So you do the opposite. You first build what you need, then when you, when you have it, you might consider extracting one or two features out. I'm thinking, I'm thinking collectively rather than like, uh, you know, each community will do this, that's why. Okay. I mean, I, I feel like there's lots of effort, you said duplication, I think, whereas you could get like 20 people like to develop the next uh, node database, which is like uh, good. Because in the, next, in the last uh, five or six years, I haven't seen much development, you know, like in what a day no database can do. It's true, it failed. The effort failed. Could you slow down, please? Um, about this specific problem, uh, I haven't thought about it. I, I mostly focused on getting the basic uh, building blocks and trying to get them right. So maybe afterwards we can add other building blocks if needed. But maybe these five objects that we have now are enough to uh, build the type of application you're mentioning. Um, maybe. I'm not really sure, but that's the goal. That's the goal, the long-term goal. Okay. Okay, another question. Okay, maybe one last question in the same direction. Okay, one last question in the same direction. How would you handle extensions of your format? So are there kind of extension points or points where you say, there, other users or other communities can add information. Okay. Maybe not just creating a new uh, type, for instance, but also all the relations between these things. Okay. Um, some objects have a property um, member, let's say, a property key, which is another JSON object in which you can put as many properties you need to represent your use case. But you could also add properties, uh, keys, and values wherever you want in the JSON structure. The parsers should just ignore those. That's, is that clear? You could, you could do that already with GeoJSON. In GeoJSON, the standard the specification allows any not specified key to be there, no problem. 
think the problem you will get, you kind of want that everyone uses the same schema or the same format for sharing the information. But as always, the implementers make false assumptions on what you want, or maybe they didn't read what your specification told them. So you end up having that each of these parcels has to deal with malformatted mm. things. So I think there, there might be an option to kind of have a layering architecture with the core of the thing of your schema and certain extensions which enrich what you want so that anyone can add a new layer to what you already provide. Yes, um, I think there are a few points where this is easyable, easily doable. Uh, I will think about it. Thank you. Okay. I think at the moment, I think we are uh, defining this core, defining the minimal set of values to make this stuff usable for the software we have right now. And we can always add fields later, but it's much more difficult to change a field. Let's say the definition, how we define a, an edge between two points in the network graph. If you suddenly say, yeah, I don't want to do it in a different way, then you are not comfortable. So at the moment we are talking about getting what fields do we need and think they are really, really useful. Some of them we make option because they yes, that usually we want to have to standardized and everything else at the moment is in properties. I think there are quite a few implementations on NetJSON that already provide additional data, including my own, in the properties object, and we are talking about which of this data might be useful enough to put it into the standardized core. So that should be not, uh, not a problem as long as the core features, the mandatory fields are there, they are used in the way the specification says. Yeah. Thank you very much. If you have other questions or doubts or you want to talk to me, you can find me uh, later. And thank you again.